Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first session back from lunch. This is Developing the Offshore Wind Industry in Australia, a Federal Perspective. Um, my name is Morgan Rossiter. Uh, I lead the Offshore Wind Policy for the Clean Energy Council. Um, before I start, I would first like to respectfully acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land and waters in which we work and live. Um, today we are meeting on the Wurundjeri land, or the, sorry, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, as an industry, as we accelerate the transition to a clean energy future, it is important that we commit to collaborate with First Nations communities to promote sustainable practice and to protect ancient sites and culture, uh, and that is on both country and sea country. Uh, now, our first speaker for today is Shane Gaddis, uh, and he's going to speak about developing the offshore wind industry in Australia. Uh, Shane is the head of adaption and new... And, Shane is the head of the Adaption and New Industries Division in the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. In this role, Shane has a responsibility for climate policy and climate adaption, hydrogen, CCS and offshore renewables. Shane has previously held senior executive roles in environmental regulation, energy and resources. Please welcome Shane. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, and firstly, apologies. It's late in the piece, uh, and most of my thunder has already been stolen by my Deputy Secretary, by the Minister this morning, and also by uh, um, who, met, who you met this morning uh, from the Victorian Government. So before I start, I'd also like to associate myself with Morgan's acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting today. Um, it's late in the piece, so bear with me. Uh, I was originally going to give you a bit of a process update, but I might just tweak that a little bit and, and sort of cross-check some of the themes that we've been hearing across this, uh, the sessions in this conference and what we're doing to address those. So firstly, uh, who am I? So, uh, as Morgan highlighted, my job's changed slightly since we did that one. I'm now the head of the Net Zero Industries Division. We have a more industry decarbonisation focus and I don't deal with, carb, uh, with, uh, with climate policy quite so much anymore. Um, but my, relevant to this talk, my division is responsible for rolling out the offshore declaration areas. So uh, Morgan did sort of say I should tease you with, uh, with the outcome of the feasibility licence process. If you hang around till the end, I'll tell you who the successful applicants would be, <laughs> but we won't be doing that. Um, uh, my background, I've worked in fisheries policy for a long period of time, fisheries regulation, energy policy, environment regulation, uh, also uh, offshore oil and gas and onshore oil and gas regulation. So I'm, I'm new to offshore wind, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm reasonably well suited. If that's not enough, uh, I'm a lifelong sailor and I've committed the nine city to Hobart Yacht Races, so I know what it's like offshore, so I know that the sorts of environments the sector will be working in. So. The message I wanted to get across to the sector from today's session is that we're listening. So it's early in the, it's early in the journey for, for the Commonwealth Government for offshore, offshore wind, but we're doing a lot of consultation, we're coming to a lot of these sorts of events, we're listening and we're responding. So we're hearing you and we're responding. So some of the things that I've heard uh, over the last 24 to 48 hours are we need a long-term view from government, we need policy certainty. We need a roadmap to implementation, we need scale, we need speed, and we need predictability. And if you listen to a lot of the sessions, you'd hear a lot of that as we go through each of them. So I'll try to cover off some of those as I go through the talk and make the linkages to the things that we're doing with those messages. Um, as Minister Bowen mentioned this morning, in, in, in the Australian context, we're a bit of a school kid that's a bit behind on the energy transition homework, and we're, we're really, really cramming to catch up. Uh, my team feels that every day. The minister, every time we talk to the minister, he wants something in the offshore wind space done sooner, faster, quicker, better. Um, we're learning as we go. Our consultation's getting more mature as we go through the processes uh, and we'll continue to get better. But first to address the, the, the roadmap, the predictability, what is it that government wants out of this? So at the highest level, the government's committed to net zero by 2050. We've got more ambitious climate targets for 2030, uh, and the minister has set a target for 82% renewables by 2030. Uh, 
Back in July, the Minister announced that he's going to develop with his colleagues six sectoral decarbonisation plans, and they'll drive decarbonisation across the economy. Relevant to this sector is the, uh, the energy electricity decarbonisation plan, and you can guarantee that while 2030 isn't, it's not going to be a big piece for offshore wind in Australia, from 2030 to 2050, offshore wind will have a big role to play. So we're still electrifying everything. As we get to 82%, that last 18% will be a lot, and it will get bigger because we, our, our electricity demand will go up. So it's, it's, everyone in the room already knows this, it's not news, but, but the government is coming out with high-level frameworks that gives industry the certainty that there's a role to play here. Integral to this is that the Commonwealth Government and states' views around offshore wind development. So I've been in lots of conversations with state government colleagues and the Minister about them wanting to be the next area that's declared. So there's strong demand from the Commonwealth for area declarations and strong demand for states. The Minister spoke also about the need to develop a new industry. It's a big undertaking, it comes with challenges, it comes with opportunities. At the moment, all you will have seen from the Commonwealth is the declaration areas and some of the consultation around regulation. We're doing a lot of other things. You probably don't see that just yet, but you will soon. And I'll, and I'll touch on that as we go through. But we want the industry to grow from a very mature basis and in a sustainable way. The sector's going to want relationships for 40 years in some of these areas and even longer. We can't get off to the wrong start. So I probably skipped over a number of slides there by not clicking the green button. So I'll just catch us up. So in terms of where we're up to, just bear with me while I forget which slide we're up to. So over the past 12 months, we've had significant progress. Um, in August last year, oh, sorry, before I start that one, before the election last year, the, the, the OEI Act was passed through, through the parliament and it would pass through with bipartisan support, and that's important. It means that it's supported by both major parties and the parliament. In August last year, when the new government came to power, the minister announced six priority areas. These were strategically chosen for the impressive wind resource potential, the existing energy generation facilities and industrial hubs that were close to them, the proximity to major ports, which has been a theme throughout the last 24, 48 hours, and also industry interest in developing the areas near those regions. Since then, two have been declared. Uh, Gippsland in December 2022, and just last month in the Hunter region. We've got two currently underway, and this is putting a lot of pressure on my teams to get this done concurrently. And that's in the Southern Ocean region between Portland and Victoria, and Port McDonald, South Australia, and the Illawarra of New South Wales. And importantly, the minister spoke this morning and his messaging was consistent with the industry's desire for more predictability. He gave a sense of when the remaining two areas will be, will be open for consultation. So he spoke about uh, the next one that will be open for consultation will be uh, North Tassie, and that will occur in October. And then the one in WA of Perth Bunbury area, which will happen in November. Broadly, this also aligns with the Global Offshore Wind Alliance's key focus areas for 2023, which is optimising permitting processes and fast-tracking the release of more potential areas. So shifting gears a little bit, as I said earlier, externally, it would look like our focus is all on quickly rolling out the OEI framework and declaring areas. We've also been considering the role the domestic supply chains play in delivering our offshore wind ambitions, including skills, jobs, production and logistic capabilities. We're aware of what our comparative advantages are. We, we hear that. Um, we've got a really established capability in the offshore oil and gas sector. We've got strong capability onshore renewables. Um, we've got a very credible offshore regulator, and Owen will speak to that shortly. We've got a good manufacturing base. But we're also aware that there are some of those issues, and we've heard some of those over the last 24, 48 hours around um, ports, supply chains, 
the need for predictability from government. So we'll be, we'll be out talking to people about that over the next uh, six to 12 months, and I'll have more to say about that potentially at future conferences. Collaboration. This is a key, this is a key one for us. We can't do this alone. So uh, I know it's new to some people, but Australia is a federation of states. The Commonwealth has responsibility for the offshore areas outside of three nautical miles. We can't do this without a strong relationship with states and territories. At the moment, we've got a really strong relationship with Victoria because it's the most forward-leaning in terms of its, its progress. It's got two areas. We're also setting up, uh, we've set up a, a national working group which sits under the Industri Energy and Climate Ministerial Council and we'll set up individual bilateral relationships with each of the states and territories as we declare those in, in each of those areas. We've got a strong track record of working together in this space. So it's a similar scheme for the offshore oil and gas sector where states and territories work closely with the Commonwealth. Uh, and we think that between the interface between the states who have energy policy responsibility and will be running the, the, the auctions and the Commonwealth that has the regulation responsibilities offshore, we can hit that sweet spot that people have been looking for. Uh, we spoke a little bit also in the last 24 to 48 hours about opportunities for APAC. So Australia has a strong relationship of entering bilateral relationships with key trading partners. At the moment, it's mostly North Asian trading partners, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, China. Um, to date, most of the development has been in Europe, but we're happy to leverage those trading relationships we have both in Europe and in North Asia to start to work through bilateral agreements with key countries, to start to look at those areas where we can work together, where's the comparative advantage for each of us and our partners. So we'll start to talk to, to, to existing partners about how to, how to roll that out. At the moment, we've got a few uh, clean energy partnerships in our APAC region with Japan, Korea, Singapore and India. So we think we can just tweak those a little bit and start to look at how we can address some of the issues that were raised this week in terms of what's the sweet spot for each country to play in the, in the supply chain in the region. Moving to priority work streams. So it won't be a shock to you to hear that the priority work streams at the moment are community consultation. So we, we can't roll out a sector unless the community accepts it. We're working very hard on assessing the feasibility license applications and working through the regulations for those processes. Uh, and we're also working to develop the second stage of regulations that will come through once we get into the management planning and the next stage of the licensing process. So community consultation is embedded in the legislation, but it's also the right thing to do. And the minister spoke earlier today again about we need to make sure that we bring communities along with us. Um, we've been doing a lot of consultation in each of the areas where, we, where, the, where, the, where the declared areas will, will eventually end up. And we're, we're getting a mix of views. At one end of the spectrum, it's we're really looking forward to the, the, the local jobs, uh, the investment, the opportunities. Uh, and at the other end, there's concerns about the, the lack of information about potential impacts, uh, particularly the environment and existing users. What, just digging into that a little bit more, some of, the, some of the key concerns we're hearing from communities are visual amenity, environmental impacts, uh, the acute impacts on tourism, commercial and recreational fishing, uh, impacts on culturally significant sites and values, and maritime safety. In some of those community consultation processes, it's clear also that energy literacy is not very strong. So people aren't quite sure why we need an energy transition. Why can't we just continue to use the current energy we've got? So we've had to go back, the teams have had to go back and explain what the energy transition looks like in that region. And, and quite often there's a lot of opposition to that. Uh, we've also heard loud and clear that we need to get better and better at engaging with First Nations people. And not just engaging with First Nations people, but looking at ways to get better outcomes, benefit sharing with, with, with First Nations people. Um, we'll do more in that space. Uh, we've heard we need to do more concrete actions to, to demonstrate the benefit sharing. 
and we'll come back with more options on that as we go through the the, the process for the regulations. But I'm just putting that on putting people at the industry on notice that we we need to do better there. That the current government's focus is very much strongly on First Nations engagement, better outcomes, closing the gap. So we'll, we'll as a sector need to work towards that. The minister spoke earlier today also about the the, the energy. Infrastructure Commissioner is doing a piece around um, best practice community engagement, and that will be due later this year. So we'll start to feed some of that out to the sector as the, as the Commissioner provides the Minister with a nice Christmas present around the final report to his review. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to get onto the outcomes of the feasibility licence process. Jokes, just jokes. Um, <laughs> So the, the applications for the feasibility licence process uh, were invited earlier this year. Very strong applications for the Gippsland area, 37 were received for the registrar, and the Hunter area recently opened, and it will remain open until the 14th of November this year. I've been talking to the crew from the registrar over the last few days, uh, and we're hoping to get an answer to, for the first pass of those feasibility processes in the coming months. Uh, what, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to touch on was uh, at the previous conference at the Clean Energy Summit, people asked me questions about the consequences of running the, the sequences so quickly after each other and are you putting in place the things that you're learning as you go through the first visibility licence process to make sure the proponents in the second declaration area can learn from those and the answer to that is yes. So following the Gippsland application round, we made numerous changes to the administrative forms that are released by the registrar and also the policy guidance that the registrar releases. So if you have not gone and had a look at the, the latest policy guidance out there, you need to do that um, because we have put in place changes based on the learnings that we have from the first process. So it's not that we're just continuing to do it the same process. I personally approved some policy guidance changes after the first one and we learned where we could improve things a little bit. Moving on to regulations, because I know you all are very excited about regulations and government regulations. Um, the first stage of the regulations and guidelines were released in November, November 22, and these covered licensing schemes, fees, treatment of existing infrastructure. We consulted before we did that. Um, very soon, we'll come out with a second tranche of regulations, which will deal with those things that the feasibility license holders will need to engage with to go through the next stages towards commercial licensing. That includes management plans, financial securities, workplace health and safety, uh, safety and protection zones, uh, and a range of other things. So consultation on those is, is anticipated later this year, so do keep an eye on, on our website because we will be releasing those soon. Um, and for those of you that have a, a really keen interest in, in regulation and regulators, Arwen is going to come on shortly and wow you with uh, the work that uh, NOPSEMA and the offshore regulator continue to do. So just in, in, in wrapping up, I know this one's a bit, of a bit of a flat presentation because the wind's already been stolen by more, by more senior people, but we are hearing you. We're out consulting with the, with the sector. We're consulting with the community. We're listening. We are acting. We may not be acting as quickly as you see us acting, but there's a lot of things that are going on in the background that we haven't, we're not quite ready to talk to you about, but we will be shortly. So um, we're very keen on getting this industry up and going, very keen on, on forming a good, strong relationship with the communities in which you operate. So we want to make sure we're getting that right from the very beginning. Uh, and if you need to contact us, that's our renewables team, but they are everywhere throughout the area over the next 24 hours, so do reach out, come and have a chat to me, uh, and we can find some time to talk. Thank you. Thanks, Shane, for the update, and it's uh, very brave of you to be making jokes about the feasibility licences to this audience. <laughs> Especially now everyone's got your email. All right, our second session, we'll have Owen Wilson um, from the Offshore Infrastructure Regulator. Uh, Owen's the Executive Director, uh, Director, 
Director of Australia's newly established offshore infrastructure regulator. Owen and his team are currently providing regulatory and operational advice to the Australian Government on, the developing, on developing the regulatory framework for offshore renewables, including in relation to work, health and safety, um, environmental management and infrastructure integrity matters. Um, give me a hand in welcoming Owen. Thank you, Morgan, and good afternoon, everyone. Look, <clears throat> I'm just going to take what Shane said at face value in that I'm going to assume everybody in this room is just as passionate about government, government regulation as I am. Um, and so I'm expecting that you're going to be enthralled by what's to come. So thanks, Shane, for the kind introduction to the topic. Um, I'd also like to add uh, my acknowledgement to that of, of Shane and, and Morgan, um, and also as a national regulator, just to acknowledge the continuing connection of First Nations people to land and waters Australia-wide and the waters in which these projects are going to be built. So first... If we can get that to work, big green button, there we go. Uh, first, I'd just like to cover a little bit about who we are, what we do and where we fit in the context of the government agencies who are involved in the offshore renewable sector. So up on that slide there is just a number of the regulatory functions that, that we have to administer. Um, the perceptive of you may notice that work, health and safety is up there twice. That's definitely not a last minute editing error on my part. That's to highlight the importance of work, health and safety as part of what it is that we do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move through the presentation. Um, but we are an independent regulatory body and we're established under, under national law. So Shane mentioned NOPSEMA, which is the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, which is already an established regulator for offshore oil and gas and for greenhouse gas injection and storage. And what this new piece of legislation that's come through does, the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act, is extends the functions of NOPSEMA to administer the functions of this new regulatory body, the Offshore Infrastructure Regulator. But that's where the connection sort of ends. The Offshore Infrastructure Regulator has a, a different set of functions and roles and powers under a separate piece of legislation and reports through to Chris Bowen as the Minister for Climate Change and Energy as opposed to Madeleine King, who is the current Minister for Resources and who uh, the NOPSEMA side of the regulator reports through to. So that's just to give you a bit of context about who we are. Um, our role commences once um, Shane's team and the registrar get to the point of making recommendations about feasibility licences. I can't tell you who's got them either, I'm sorry. Um, and once Minister Bowen's announced who's got those feasibility licences and they come into force. So that's when our formal regulatory role starts. And with the enabling legislation now in place, the granting of the licences forthcoming, the next step in the journey for us is to ensure that this industry can be uh, implemented and developed in a safe and environmentally responsible and sustainable way. And that's our really key focus. So whilst our core responsibilities relate to regulation of work, health and safety, infrastructure integrity, environmental management, we also have a broader role to play in the sector. And in particular, we have a role to promote leading practice in the management of hazard and risk, uh, and to provide advice and guidance to the industry and to broader stakeholders on what the law means and what compliance with the law looks like. So whilst we have a suite of compliance tools available to us, and we certainly will use those if we need to use them, um, our focus over the next sort of few years as the industry gets established is to perform that role of education and the provision of guidance and to give as much advice as we can on compliance with the requirements of the law and then we're going to be coming and monitoring that compliance um, through the management plan process which we'll talk about a little bit as well. Um, just like to give a nod to our engagement lead Sarah Miller who has done a lot of the work around um, all of the uh, pieces of information that you will have seen that we've put out already. Um, our door is very much open, so please do approach us if you've got questions about our role and about the regulations going forward. Um, this next slide is about international experience and engagement. We've been so fortunate to have the support and advice of our international counterparts, both from a regulatory perspective through GWEC, through safety bodies such as G+, uh, and we have learned a whole lot from international experience about what to do and potentially what not to do, which we then look to carry forward into the Australian jurisdiction. 
Um, our journey began back in late 2017, early 2018. Our former CEO, a gentleman by the name of Stuart Smith, um, undertook a Churchill Fellowship and he went and looked at leading practice regulation for offshore renewables in seven different European jurisdictions. Uh, brought that back to Australia, compiled a report, presented that to government, and that formed the bones on which the new uh, Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act and the regulations that have followed from that were built. Um, and if you're interested in that report, you can find that online. Um, with respect to ongoing international collaboration, we are a founding member of the Global Offshore Wind Regulators Forum, um, and that forum, which was established back in 2019, brings together regulators from both experienced and emerging jurisdictions to share lessons learnt uh, and best practice regulatory approaches in wind planning, licensing and regulatory oversight. We also had the honour and the privilege um, this week of meeting with our counterparts from Vietnam, India, Sri Lanka and the Philippines and starting to build those connections in the APAC region and start to share that knowledge at a more regional level as well. Um, Australia is also the current chair of the International Regulators Forum, which is a forum traditionally of offshore oil and gas safety regulators with 11 different countries coming together to share experience on offshore oil and gas. But Australia, with a couple of other countries, has recently led an initiative to expand the scope of that forum to start collaborating on offshore renewable safety. Because what we found is that traditional oil and gas regulators around the world are having their remits expanded to start looking at offshore renewable safety, us inclusive. And so we'll be setting up a subcommittee under that body to be um, specifically looking at renewable safety. Um, to take a lead from Andy Evans, I'm going to do a bit of a shameless plug. Australia is hosting the IRF conference um, from the 3rd to the 4th of October over in Perth, which will bring together safety regulators from around the world. Uh, we're doing the first offshore wind session there, so if people are interested, please come across to Perth and, and come and join us at that conference later this year. And we're going to continue to benefit from strong international engagement into the future through uh, sharing these approaches to addressing many of the common challenges that each of the jurisdictions internationally face. All right, I told you we were going to talk about work health and safety and we most definitely are. So as this infrastructure becomes larger, the projects are getting sited in more remote locations. We've got floating infrastructure starting to come into the picture. Um, the risk picture for safety in offshore wind is becoming increasingly complex and we're very conscious of that. And whilst we can draw some parallels with safety in offshore oil and gas, in the maritime industry, even with the onshore construction industry, we think it's the combination of all of this as these aspects which present some pretty unique sort of health and safety challenges for offshore wind. And certainly that's what we've been learning from our international engagement is there's some areas with offshore wind where we need to pay particular focus and attention on work health and safety. Um, Whilst we've got a role to play and a fit for purpose regulatory regime has a role to play, it really is on the industry to take this opportunity from now to start to establish a really strong safety culture for this sector. And that takes leadership and that takes executive accountability and that takes oversight. And the safety of your workforce and the safety of your people offshore should be paramount and should be at the centre of each of your conversations. And that's what our expectation is going to be, is that people out there are protected and are going to come home at the end of the day after a long day's work. So it's really important in the Australian context that new entrants into the industry are provided with the information that they need, the training that they need, the supervision that they need to ensure that they're able to do their job safely. Um, through our regulatory oversight and through proactive compliance monitoring, we're, we're going to be seeking to ensure that appropriate practices and systems are in place at a whole of project level prior to project commencement. And we're going to be placing an onus on the licence holder to ensure that whoever is working on their project, whether that be contractors, subcontractors or individuals, that they've got appropriate systems in place to maintain that oversight and to ensure that people are being kept safe. Consultation with the workforce I'll also touch on that's going to be a critical component in assuring the safety and uh, safe and responsible deployment of this infrastructure and we'll expect to be seeing consultation with the workforce hardwired into the management planning process at po appropriate points during the development life cycle. Also talk a little bit about infrastructure integrity. So successful and safe exploitation of offshore renewable energy uh, resources is contingent on long-term infrastructure reliability and safety. And maintaining infrastructure integrity is also intrinsically linked to those work health and safety outcomes and needs to be a key focus at all of the project stages, from the very early stages of design all the way through to decommissioning. Um, 
we recognise that many of the decisions that are critical to the management of safety um, and infrastructure integrity, environmental hazards and risks are made quite early on in the project process. And so we've implemented or are assisting the department with implementing a design notification scheme through regulations, which will provide an opportunity for early engagement and feedback from the regulator on design philosophy and approach, including standards that are to be applied to the design and installation and ongoing operations and maintenance of these facilities. We also recognise that te technologies are evolving really rapidly in the sector, and the design notification scheme is also intended to flush out where we've got novel technologies. If we have gaps in standards, if we have gaps in risk and hazard management, we'll be expecting licence holders to lay out a process as to how they're going to address those gaps prior to getting to construction to provide assurance that that, uh, that, that infrastructure is fit for purpose and can be deployed safely. And where possible, we will seek to recognise and leverage existing assurance processes. We know developers are going through processes like third, third party certification and verification and other things for, for finance and insurance and other things. So we will seek to recognise those processes through the design notification scheme as well. So in relation to environmental management, um, Australia's ocean economy is very much reliant on the long-term health and resilience of our oceans. Uh, and we have unique physical, ecological, social and cultural aspects that will influence whether offshore energy projects can proceed and whether they can be delivered responsibly and meet the expectations of society. So these aspects need to be identified and understood early on to determine whether different or innovative approaches to impact and risk management are needed. And Australia has some very strong protections for marine fauna and migratory species, which should be looked at and recognised very early on. Um, Important to clarify that we are not responsible for primary environmental approvals, and I think a number of people have, have covered it on this as well, and Erin Coldham mentioned it before, but primary environmental approvals are separate from the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act. They're obtained under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act through the Minister for the Environment. Um, and this assessment process is not only going to look at ecological impacts, but is also going to examine the potential impacts of proposals on social and cultural values, including First Nations cultural heritage. And so the outcomes of that process and decisions made by the Minister are proposed to be reflected in the management plan, and we'll be monitoring compliance through the management plan with those obligations under the EPBC Act, and where we find a, a potential breach of an obligation in relation to environmental management, we'll be working with our colleagues uh, in the environment part of the department to pursue uh, appropriate actions in response to those contraventions. All right, I don't want to steal the thunder of Shane's team in, in releasing uh, regulations around management plans, so I'm not going to say too much about management plans, except that the purpose of the management plan is to bring all of those elements that we've described before together, um, plus a bunch of other elements. So, you know, the, the operational details of your activity, what are you doing out there, when are you doing it, how are you doing it, and, you know, where are you doing it? Um, bringing all of that out, um, as well as um, elements such as uh, financial security, early stage plans for decommissioning, um, and those two things are intrinsically linked to one another. And so we'll be expecting to say, see early stage plans for decommissioning on the basis of full removal of infrastructure. Out of that, we'll be looking for a cost estimation in relation to decommissioning, and then a financial security arrangement will be entered into that'll be commensurate to those costs and be held for the, for the life of the project. So the management plan is intended to be an operational document. It describes the details of the activities that are going to be undertaken under the licence, but it will evolve with the licence as the project evolves. And so we anticipate that management plans will start to uh, be revised probably fairly often in the early stages, and then once we get to steady state operations, you know, there's a, there's a trigger there for them to be revised periodically or when they meet certain thresholds. And so we will be seeing the management plans come back through. And a part of that is about driving continuous improvement in management of work health and safety risk, environmental risk and those other things that we've spoken about. Um, something else that's important to touch on there is the outcomes of consultation with other marine users as well. So where we have projects that are directly impacting on other marine users, such as fishers or other rights holders uh, out in the ocean space, we will be expecting to see that consultation has been undertaken uh, with those entities uh, and that negotiated outcomes have been achieved or mitigations have been put in place and they all need to be documented in the management plan as well. 
So just in closing, I think I'm starting to run out of time. Um, we are approaching a critical juncture for the industry as we move towards the grant of the first feasibility licences and the commencement of, of on-water activities out there. And the approach of the early projects, these leading projects to industry, industry collaboration, engagement with communities and with First Nations, uh, engagement with other marine users, approaches to project delivery and planning, is really going to set the benchmark for all of those projects to follow. Long-term acceptance of the offshore industry is going to be reliant on those early moving projects delivering renewable energy in a safe and transparent and responsible way, and we're certainly going to be having oversight of that. As a national regulator, we work first and foremost for the Australian public, um, and we'll be expecting the industry to be following international leading practice and to innovate where it's required to manage the risks of these projects effectively. It's beholden on both the industry and government to build trust and to ensure that we're able to do our jobs effectively and to develop and maintain a social licence to both operate and for us to regulate. So we really look forward to continuing the journey with the department, with the industry, with all of our stakeholders out there um, and to evolve as we move towards operational regulation of the sector. And if you need to get in contact with us, I think we've got our website on the last page. And that's that. Thanks. Thanks, Shane, and thank you, Owen. And that brings us to the end of our Federal Government Perspective session. Um, but we'd love you to stay around for our next panel discussion, which is Breaking Barriers, Can Australia Truly Lure the Global Offshore Winds Supply Chain? So please stay around for the next session. Thank you.